Cookies, the world's most influential basketball podcast. Got a great show for you today. I'm not going to try that cold opening thing like we did last week. It was cool. I liked it. You know what? I'm not sure if it's for us. We'll see. We found a new slant. Uh, a lot of good stuff to talk about. NBA Finals have come to an exciting conclusion. Delta variant running rampant. Space Jam back. Billionaires are still going to the moon in giant dicks. Speaking of which, <laughs> Andrew Quo nice. is here. Nice. The moon, or millionaires, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Speaking of millionaires, uh, billionaires. Um, Sorry. Yeah, you know, uh, just a couple dicks <laughs> recording a pod about the most amazing shit like the Delta variant and the NBA Finals. <laughs> How are you, buddy? I mean, New York is still having some weird Everglades vibes, still less than optimal in terms of swampy weather, periodic rain, just general gruesomeness. I was walking down the street and I was looking at the sidewalk and a lot of it was green, like literally fungal. Other than that, how are you? I'm good, man. I heard on the internet that some of this overcast... This, this overcast sky in New York City is because of the smoke from fires mm-hmm. from the West Coast. Just like doesn't take long for it to get here. Oh, that's true. Um, you could see that haze yeah. over the city yesterday. And if you looked at the moon last night, it was actually red. Is that because of the smoke from those? Mm-hmm. It sure is. It's fucked up, man. Love this whole apocalypse thing we're working on. Yeah. Like that Nick Drake song was Pink Moon was about the nuclear bomb, right? And then the Volkswagen used it for like a whimsical Beatle commercial, maybe. Mm-hmm. And everyone's like, oh, that's a really dark song, actually. Sounds good. Sounds great. But I always think about that. It's like, huh, it's really nice looking. <laughs> <laughs> Why? I mean, Pink Moon, that's a thing, though. That's like one of the famous mm-hmm. full moons. Like there's the Worm Moon, right, the right, Pink right. Moon, the Harvest Moon. Yeah, I could the, be wrong about this nuclear bomb thing, but I think No, I think you're it. probably right. I'm more saying that yesterday's weird orange moon was not an Erica Badu orange moon. Mm. It was a forest fire orange moon, as you correctly identified. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd like to go on the record. I, I could definitely be wrong, but it would be the you're first right. time I was wrong about everything. No, so. no, no. You have never been wrong, and you were right again on this. Yeah, cool. Cool, very cool. So, are you excited about this Delta variant? It sounds cool, right? It sounds like a Lee Majors movie. It sounds like a bunch of like random outcasts getting to back together for one last job. <laughs> Stallone is <laughs> the Delta variant. Um, yeah, man, it is uh, back in the news, and it feels like different than it did a year ago but since there's no more dt to talk about your boy donald trump this is this has been in my in my house booming through the hallways i I find it hard to care about the delta variant in terms of people who are vaccinated as in like it hasn't really changed the math by the outcome if you end up getting it and you've got your shots you will likely feel like shit but you'll be okay that that's just like generally statistically speaking that's how covid was always going to interact with people who were vaccinated but it's been described as a pandemic among the unvaccinated and i think that's where the delta variant is like really doing its damn thing Mm -hmm. really ripping it up down in places like mississippi or Alabama, when you have you know, a third of, of adults un- still, or, excuse me, only a third of adults who have gotten their shots. So, like, it's, you guys are still just, like, in it. You're still in, like, the pandy. Yeah. Or- it's kind of wild, because mentally, personally, you know, speaking for myself, <laughs> I've, I've at least moved out of that part of it. 
the like yeah. the we're in the pandemic part. I'm like, oh, you're still just mired waist deep in pandy. They they would say they've never been in pandy, True. and we were in it, and they never even stepped foot in it. Did you see Hannity the other night? <laughs> it's just like, all right, we've always taken this seriously, and I love science. Get your vaccine, and I was like, but he didn't though. I saw the clip. He didn't do that. There was. There was a mm-hmm. newfound consideration that maybe people should get vaccinated. And there was a suspicion that this came from, like the Rupert Murdoch thing. was like, bro, you're tanking the markets. Can you stop with this bullshit? Yeah. But you listen to him. He's like, you should get all the research. Do all the reading you can do. Right. Think about this very carefully. I'm like, you're still hedging, man. Just tell <laughs> people to get the shot like you did. <laughs> well, you should he... talk to your primary care can- provider. What are you fucking talking about, man? <laughs> well... It's sort of like, it reminds me of Stephen A or Skip Bayless. It's like, he's not, he's not there to report. He's a WWF entertainer, right? He's a heel. So it gets so confusing when Skip Bayless says something about LeBron James and everyone's just like, oh my God, he can't stop talking about LeBron James. This is getting nuts. I'm like, oh, he, what he's done, he's just doing his job, right? And like Sean Hannity, like... If anything, Fox News is predictable. So hearing that was kind of a surprise, and immediately the conspiracy was that maybe it was a stock market-related issue or maybe it was a legal-related issue because right afterwards, Tucker Carlson and uh, the show afterwards, um, I forgot her name, Laura Ingraham, and doubled down on the fact that there was no pandemic. So it was kind of confusing. It was like a miss. A mixed signal a little bit. I mean, I don't feel like getting into a long discussion about no. the politic the politicalization of of the capandy. Mm. Like we don't need to go down that route. Yeah. But it's very clear what those lines were. You mm-hmm, know, it was like mm-hmm. Trump didn't want to get blamed for it and the wealthy people who control the Republican Party wanted people to go back to work. But like we understand why half the country was predisposed to dislike the idea of a vaccine because of their political beliefs. Mm -hmm. But when you look at it in retrospect, you're like, man, that was some dumb, 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 dumb shit to make it a statement, whether you get a vaccination or not. Like really wild, really wild. There's so many things you could have gotten mad about, like, like that infernal critical race theory. (laughs) <laughs> but instead, you decided it's going to be getting a fucking shot. Like the right. kind of thing you get when you travel to, say, another country. Like, <laughs> like that you get when you're born. Right. They Just should, a very yeah. odd line in the sand. Yeah, they should. They do. I mean, politics, people do best with cultural stuff, as we're finding out. So to, to your point, mm-hmm. to, to apply cultural stuff to science is like really tough. They're like, maybe this thing will just last two weeks and it will look amazing. It's like, the science says it's not gonna happen that way probably. It's like, well, we're gonna we're gonna think it does. And uh, yeah, I'm surprised they weren't more vague about it. it I, mean, I mean, I do think applying cultural ideas to science and to history is part and partial to like what the Republican Party typically does. Like, that's their game. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's even this debate about critical race theory. It's like, that's history, but let's make it cultural. Well, history is different than, like, a scientific thing, like probability, right? They could be like, all Democrats lose at blackjack. I'm like, ooh, you don't want to go there because that's kind of hard to prove. It's like, you know what? If you believe in the Bible, you're going to win at poker. It's like, that's also really tough. But, also, but also, like, crime is statistical, right? And Ooh, that doesn't that's, stop that's, from being a cultural thing, like tough on crime. I, I would say it's not statistical only because those stats are based off of ideas that are very nebulous as we're finding out. Like what constitutes a crime, right? It's like, that's a high crime area. It's like, well, what happens? Like marijuana. It's like, ah, oh. <laughs> this is kind of more complicated than um, a slot machine, right? Well, uh, look, my main point here is just that the lens of culture war is typically put over everything. And Ben Simmons, for sure. Oh, it's and a that's, culture conversation. It's a culture sure. conversation. Yeah. I, again, everything gets put through this, so yeah. it is deeply unsurprising to have 
the vaccine also become cultural. I'm just saying, man, that was some dumb shit. And I don't know that Joe Biden really understood that there was such deep rooted hesitation from people to get it. They may have, but I didn't feel like they went as aggressively as they may have, or maybe they were just optimistic or they didn't really have a game plan, but like we're not where we're supposed to be in terms of national vaccination. That's for sure. Yeah. And we're doing better than so many other countries. And, you know, I just, people are talking these days about if there's a booster shot that has to be had, if you're, you know, Pfizer saying like, we might have to give you a third shot. Like, is it ethical for us to get third shots before other countries don't have any? Like, it's an interesting conversation. I have no answer for it. But um, I'm always surprised to hear that not everyone can get the shot at the same time. And um, and then you realize quickly, like, Pfizer is a private company, and this is one of the most profitable things to have ever happened in society. So it's very confusing. But, um, yeah, I don't know. We are not where we're supposed to be. And I was walking around the Lower East Side the other day, and there's people out there being like, hey, is everyone vaccinated? Here's some masks. Does everyone want to go in? And, like, classic New Yorkers, everyone's like, ah, get out of my face. Yeah, I was vaccinated the first time. Stop bothering me about it. And these these people are just like, hey, man, we're just trying to like find one today. <laughs> like two people today would be great. You know, it's tough. I mean, I do not watch Fox News or CNN or anything like that. I just don't consume televised news. That's not a. But you follow on Twitter and stuff. A bit. Right. But again, I'm I'm up to news? I'm saying I'm up to date via Twitter on what's happening. Oh, OK, okay. Like yeah, that. Yeah. I'm saying I don't watch what's being broadcast. So I just don't know how this is being presented by CNN or by Fox like or by NPR. I just I'm just blissfully unaware of that. It's almost more pure than Twitter. Um, you know, they Twitter's a tough place. Twitter's Stephen A. Smith. It is, it is pure entertainment. So is the broadcast, no doubt. But uh, the broadcast just like funnel their information to Twitter and then Twitter people go off. I mean, I was just thinking about when, you know, Twitter says it's Ben Simmons birthday. Ha ha ha. Oh. And it's just like you, you see the interactions. What troll did that? You see the interactions that are going to happen, right? And I feel like this is the same thing when someone puts up any article being like, a breakthrough case and someone goes through and, and you're just like man you're just trying to get interaction like everyone knew there was going to be breakthrough cases it's not even a, it's not even news it's not a thing and it's like you're just trying to rile people up to get people flooding into the comments to say i knew this was like it didn't work the vaccines are a fraud and then other people to jump in and be like i hope you die of covid yeah, yeah. Like it, i'm like it's all just based on generating hate not like the joy of basketball which is based on generating joy yeah that's when joy will conquer all hatred on october 19th oh, available man. at your local bookseller and online for pre-sale get, get that joy in early but yeah i digress joy is coming in fall <laughs> but for now yeah. we're stuck getting these hate clicks i i mean We've been talking about our feelings about Twitter for a while now, and uh, it's not getting better. Um, I love it still, but like, this is where people just go to act out their toxic fantasies, right? Like, I don't even believe these people care this much about Ben Simmons, <laughs> but this is where you go to be like, he's trash and you're trash for mentioning him. I'm like, oh man, this is just like a kid experimenting when he throws a rock at a window being like is the window gonna break i'm like yeah dude it's gonna break <laughs> I, but yeah the the stuff that's been really irritating and i try to avoid reading any of the comments is when it's showing that a certain percentage of people who were hospitalized for covid had vaccinations and it's like i know what's unfurling beneath this post i know why you're posting this and i i'm really trying to avoid it yeah, I mean, we've always had two different approaches, I think both correct approaches about this. I kind of don't even get that far. I'm just like, unless there's a huge, huge turn, I think we know what we're supposed to know. We know what's safe. We know what has a little bit 
medium and high risk, right? Like we know all of these things already. They were kind of discussed early on. Um, and then everything else is like dependent on where you are in your own life, how happy you are doing certain things. If, if you love traveling, you'll find a way to justify getting on a plane. And I think that's awesome. I think people, people should do that. But there is like a small risk there. The Olympics is going to be tricky, but it, I spoke to someone from Japan who's like older. He's in his 70s. And he was like, this is a dream come true. Please don't cancel it. And his brother just died from COVID. And he was just like, I wish my brother was alive to see this because my city is going to be awesome. You know? And I was like, that's cool, man. <laughs> like, I can't fight with that. It's like, ah. And he's like, I know the dangers of it, but like, what a beautiful thing to happen to my hometown. I'm like, totally, totally. I mean, look, I do not wish any harm on people who are vaccine hesitant. I hope you avoid COVID. Oh yeah, dude. Like I, that, that would be cool for you if you were able to avoid it at this point, me personally, I'm doing what I want. And like, you should protect yourself if you are not getting vaccinated or you can just say, I accept those terms. Like yeah, that, that, I think that's what everyone should do at this point. Like the best thing you can do is to go get vaccinated. And yeah, everyone should do that for sure. Like, cool, get vaccinated. And again, if you are unwilling to do it, then you should say, okay, I'm going to take precautions or I'm going to throw caution to the wind. And if I get COVID, I will, I will deal with it. Listen, you're at clandestino. You're feeling good. You got a seat. You're about to take down N beer. Some people would be like, whoa, whoa, that's too much beer. I'm only going to have half of N beer. It's kind of the same thing, right? It's just like, I'm going to go nuts. Forget tomorrow. I'm having this beer. Someone else might be like, I'm not even setting foot in Dime Square. The place is too hot. I, I just don't feel like after you're vaccinated, you should be torn about like what you do. I think you should decide what your own comfort level is. That's it. Like me personally, like I'm not going to eat outside because I'm worried about the Delta variant. Just like I just don't want to live like that. That doesn't mean that I'm every night I'm going out, but I'm literally not going to think about it when I walk into a place since I'm vaccinated. If I end up getting sick for a few days, it is what it is. I would, I would, I hope I don't. When we know yeah. Delta's on the rise. When you walk into a bar, you kind of, at this point, to me, assume, yeah, there's a little something floating around in here. Might, might, might Definitely. sting me. Yeah. Still, it's possible. But like with the grave danger pretty much alleviated, Statistically yeah. speaking, I feel like it, it's like trying to avoid the flu. And I'm not comparing COVID to the flu. I mean, once it's worst case scenario is flu-like, then you can kind of weigh your options yeah. in a sense of where does your comfort lie? Is it in not being sick for a week or is it staying inside all the time? Like that's up that that to me is like up to you. If you were living in LA and they reinstated a mask mandate, would you wear a mask? No. Why would I wear a mask? To protect other people from the I'm possibility. Saying I'm, it, of, they should get vaccinated. Uh, but if they don't, like my whole thing is like, I don't really agree culturally with a lot of people who are not getting the vaccine. And but I don't want them to get sick and I don't want anything bad to happen to them. So I'm always like, you can't shoot guns or barbecue meat <laughs> if you're dead. So wear the mask and live another day to do these things I don't care about. Like drive your pickup trucks with the with the metal testicles hanging from the, the back. Like you can't do that if you're dead. I, I hear you and I think that's compassionate and I'm not wishing ill on anyone. Mm. I just am beyond caring. Like they know, they know the deal. This has been around for a year and a half. This is not some new shit where people are like, all right, explain this COVID thing to me. What's the deal with COVID? I'm like, if you just won't get it, you're on your own. Like in terms of how I'm going to behave. Like, cause then you shouldn't be there. Yeah. Not me. You shouldn't be there. Oh, that's a very, that's a very capitalist point of view. It's not capitalist at all. It's literally not completely uncapitalist. It's uh, the survival of the fittest. No, it's about like 
if you want me to wear a mask mm. because you are unwilling to get vaccinated and you are unwilling to wear a mask, then like we're at an impasse, right? Yeah, I, I, to me, I, I think that's that's even more complex than I, I go. And I hear where you're coming from, for sure. There's a level of frustration because it's right there, right? Like the, I'm hungry. I'm like, here's some food. It's like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm hungry. I'm like, well, here's some food. And it's, it, it's, it's like dealing with an infant, right? Like, or, I mean, that's not, that's not fair. But like, I just think that there's a way to look at it as a simpler problem, which is some people don't think what I think. And I cannot do a good enough job of convincing them to think the way I think and knowing that the way I think could be definitely wrong too. And they're suspecting that as well. The doubt I have in my mind is the certainty they have in theirs. So I understand that. In my opinion, I believe the vaccine is amazing and everyone should get it. That is like a triumph of like modern medicine. <laughs> Just get it. It's cool as hell. Um, and it's our job to try to convince everyone to get it if that's what we believe. Oh, I'm, I'm with you on that. And I'm not even saying, okay, you know, you have to get this vaccine. If you decide mm. that you just don't want to get it for a variety of reasons, that's fine. But just mm. protect yourself. For sure. That's, that's for not sure. on me. I don't have to walk around in the, wearing like a, some shit over my face in 95 degrees because you think that Bill Gates is putting a microchip in your arm. Like, sorry. I was talking <laughs> to my neighbor. Literally was like, I'm not getting vaccinated. New York City. New York City. Yeah. I, was, I was like, you're not getting vaccinated. She's like, nah. I was like, how come? It's like, you know... I think Bill Gates controls the weather. This, Amazing. This, she said Amazing. this. She said this. Amazing. This, this yeah. was a, a, he just like went this. up in a spaceship. That's where like, the weather happens. I was like, all right. Well, and I, and, you know, I was not being cruel at all. I was like, well, you know, I know from seeing you come in and out, you have older people in your family. And if they're not getting vaccinated either, you should just protect yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, like you should do one or the other. You're, you're working in the city, taking public transportation working in a store and then you're coming in seeing you know your older family members you guys should be careful yeah. like no judgment you should just be careful i mean i'm down for like anybody in a controlled environment for one person to be a weirdo you know whether to have like actually i think this is the right idea actually this that i think that's what makes it's a spice of life whatever in a controlled environment, if someone doesn't want to take the vaccine, totally. If everyone else does, they're at a lower risk. Almost a risk where it's just like manageable. But there's not enough, right? Like we're not at a point where your neighbor could be like, I think I'm cool. It's like, oh man, okay. But then you have to be extra careful, you know? I, I'm mostly concerned about getting Bill Gates to do something about this humidity. Well, the billionaire LeBron James flew out into outer space so he can rain down little microchips in the raindrops, right? Um, before we get onto that, which was a really nice segue <laughs> that I'm just blowing through. Um, de Blasio, your man's. My dude, BDB. BDB. Um, he decreed that healthcare workers, 30% of which are not inoculated, which was surprising to me, but you know how it goes are going to either have to get the vax or be tested weekly. I don't think that's going far enough, to be honest. Mm. I, I feel like every government job, hey, you got to get the vax or bring some like medical evidence of why you can't. Otherwise, you just got to get that shot. And my thing is, like, I don't think people should have to get it by law. I think things should be unpleasant if you don't. I think not pressuring airlines to make sure that only vax people can take flights, I think that was a mistake. I think the French approach, where they basically said this, you don't have to get it, but life is going to blow, is the best approach. Hmm. Yeah, in incentivizing people to do anything is how a lot of these billionaires become billionaires. And like, if we could figure out a way to incentivize 
everyone from like not committing crime, white collar crime, or like not eating too much junk food. Like this is like the question of everyone's lifetime, right? Like I think punishing people is the wrong way, but it works. So like, I don't want to make life harder for people who have like a legitimate belief. Like I'm not even questioning people who don't believe in the vaccine. I'm like, I get it. You can convince me, maybe, probably not, but like, it's not coming from nowhere. Um, and making their lives harder, I think, is not something I, I'm into doing. But I, like, I agree, and I don't like that either, in principle. I'm mm, with you. Mm. I also am of the opinion that like, you kind of can't let this idiocy ride. Oh, it's so hard because yeah, right. It's there's tough. a solution to this. There's a solution. Get the shot. It's a cool shot. It's really fun actually to feel like you're getting the coolest medicine. I don't know. It, it, it's not. It's a cultural thing. And I, I um, mean, I'm I'm fine if people are like, I absolutely don't want to get it. I'm so suspicious of this. Like, okay, but then if that's the case, then you have to understand that you are still living in the pandemic and other people aren't. And therefore you can't go on the airplane because you're in a pandemic and other people aren't. That's all I'm saying. I don't want it to even be punitive. It's more like life is for these people because (laughs) these situations are not safe for you if you are not going to get this shot. This is not about punishment as much as it is saying, hey, if you were willing to step up and do a little something, to get this this pandemic over, to get us through this, then you're being rewarded for it. And if your your take is, I want to do nothing, but I want to go back to living normally, that's going to be tough to do. I mean, this is the stoniest question of all time: Who's in the jail? Because they people who don't believe in the pandemic would say we've been living in this world the whole time, and they want nothing to do with it. They're like, nothing is happening. I don't agree with them, but for that's sure. their thing. You're like, for sure, we're not in jail. You're in jail. It's like no. Mm-hmm. You're in jail. We're not in jail. And it's just like, yeah. Oh, I mean, man, someone what? could be having this exact conversation the other way around. Like, I, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If oh, you get the happening. vaccine, you should yeah. be able to go on a plane. Yeah. <laughs> Planes should be for the unvaccinated. <laughs> yeah. It's like, well, we're not controlled by those microchips that we got injected into our arms. <laughs> and the <laughs> weather is going to be beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, so what you were saying before about billionaires in space. You know, mm-hmm. LeBron James. LeBron and James. Big Maverick Jeff. Carter, not quite yet. Um, Rich Paul, not quite. But maybe with the combined wealth of Adele and Rich Paul, maybe they can go to some. Mm, that would be space. good. I mean, yeah. like Bezos came so close to going to space, but just didn't want it enough. Same mm-hmm. with your, your man from, from Virgin. Branson. The Virgin King, AC yeah. Green. Yeah. Um, yeah, they are suborbital kings. Oh, they were so close. They were the Julius Randles of space travel. So it was all there for them. They were in the playoffs. All you have to do is want it, and you can get that championship. They, it's, they didn't want it. Yeah, it's, it's sub-championship kings. They're just edging on space. <laughs> Edge lords. Um, I mean, my non-cynical part is like, that's kind of amazing. I don't have any curiosity about seeing the arc of the Earth, but like cool i think there is a a lore to that and then i'm just like yo man are the boomers the last ones to care about this shit like i don't know gen x is you know doesn't quite exist because we're way too chill and tranquil in the moon sea of tranquility we are always there yeah i mean this this idea of going like, go west, young man. Like, I don't know. It's a very generational feeling, isn't it? I don't get it at all. Yeah. I literally don't understand the fascination with space. Yeah. I, I mean, on one hand... I mean, it's cool. Star Wars were cool. I mean, y- yes, of course, of course. I mean, there were, there were cool things about going to space. Yeah. It is certainly a memorable experience, I would gather. Yeah, I don't even... I left Earth. Fuck. That's yeah. sick. Yeah. Great. But I'm like... Yeah, I think not feeling gravity would be kind of cool. Like you can like pour the your like you know astronaut ice cream around and it floats. That's kind of cool. But you can do that, right? Can't people pay for those flights oh, like that this, they film the, movies on? The zero on? gravity thing where you go up and then you like just kind of like drop in the air or whatever. Yeah, there's so a I, way I would, to experience I would that, so. right? For like a couple hundred bucks, maybe a couple thousand bucks. 
Yeah, I just want that. I want to reenact the scene with like Homer and the ant farm and the chips <laughs> floating yeah. in the air. I like that. Yeah, wasn't there a Mission Impossible filmed out in zero gravity or something? I don't know. That sounds Tom Cruise right. has done everything. Has Tom Cruise been to Mars? Is he on Mars? Is he from Mars? Oh, by the way. What's up? More from my neighbor on this topic. Yes, yes. Your neighbor sounds cool as shit, by the way. <laughs> she said that all these guys, Bezos, the Virgin King, maybe LeBron, mm-hmm. when they're going up there, it's because they, they're actually going to a, a different planet that we don't know about. Man, science fiction is the best genre of storytelling. So, yeah. like, yeah. Why do you think they're going up there? They're going to a special rich planet. I was like, Amazing. Amazing. The, Amazing. The, the moon? <laughs> yeah. That's no moon. Um, the idea, there's a new movie coming out. I think it's called like Extra Man or something where it's just like a, the main characters in a video game. Is it the Juana Man sequel? <laughs> it's the Inside Man 5. Um, but it is all versions of this idea, right? Like, oh, this is all a fallacy and the real shit is right beyond beyond this wall, this Truman Show wall. And only certain people have access to it. And we're stuck mired in like this this play that is our boring lives where people with access are like living in Tron, right? Like it's kind of amazing how that idea will never go away. And it's kind of cool too. I mean to think what, about what that. was what was the movie where um Matt Damon, not the Martian, the other one, where he's like a on Earth and he has to like fly oh, up to the rich the- person like suburb in the sky. Oh, oh, I don't know. I thought you were talking about like the something bureau where he is just like falls in love with some woman and the course of his life is about simulation, right? And the course of his life takes a different direction and the writers are like, you cannot deviate from the script. No, you're thinking of rounders. Oh, that's when the Boston Celtics are trying to get TJ McConnell this summer, right? (laughs) Yeah, maybe that's Goodwill Hunting. (laughs) But no, but to your point, the idea that the rich people will leave us all behind is one that's prominent in in everything, right? And and, and all in all science fiction going on yeah. for ages. Yeah. And this is why I think this idea of a simulation is kind of enticing. Oh, if I we're love gonna, it. If yeah. we're gonna speak on, on these conceptual science hope. fiction concepts. It gives us hope. You know, the yeah. you know, the conceptual concepts. <laughs> Let's conceive of them. Yeah. But that idea is almost self-fulfilling in some ways because we dream things up through science fiction and then we make them a reality. Like we're still trying to get to flying cars, but because we've wanted flying cars for so long, eventually we will have flying cars. This is the secret. This is some Oprah book club stuff, right? But this idea that like, you know, the rich people are eventually going to go to outer space and rich people are like... Well, I am a billionaire. <laughs> I got to figure out this way to get to space as has been foretold for generations and leave these stinking masses in my wake. I mean, that's what I'm supposed to do. Like it all kind of rolls together. Like the science fiction idea, like video games are going to become like reality. You're like, all right, let's get these close to, to lifelike as possible. And then we'll do that for the next thousand years and life and video games will be indistinguishable. And you're like, so that's how the simulation comes. As long we just, as you st- we just right. merge reality and science fiction incessantly. As long as you stick to technology, because technology kind of ro- moves at a predictable rate. In other ways, it doesn't work. It's like, well, the New York Knicks in 2023 are going to have Giannis, KD, and Kyrie, and maybe Zion. And I'm like, yes, will that to happen? I'm like, all right, we got one year to go, guys. <laughs> Let's well, it's do less, this. It's less about willing it to happen <laughs> and more about uh, the path of ideas mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that science fiction already invents like a path that that's where we need to go in the future. In the future, we're going to have robot butlers and be like, all right, what should we do with robots? Someone's like, I don't know. They could like do dishes and open doors. You're like, perfect. Perfect. (laughs) I love that idea. Could they drive my car? Yeah. You could have a robot chauffeur. All right, great. That's perfect. That's exactly what the future is going to be like. I love it. I always thought that was the limitations of science fiction because of our vanity, right? The future is always like these hyper, hyper realistic humans. 
where the robot is just like Siri. <laughs> it's like, well, it's not like it doesn't have fingers. We didn't like we don't have like ankles. That whole Boston Dynamics thing. It's like the robots are dancing. I'm like, no, the robots are listening to you think about robots dancing on your phone and then buying you books about <laughs> robots dancing, you know, <laughs> or feeding you content about robots dancing. It I never mean, takes the form of arms and legs. Speaking about posts that have the most tiresome comments. Uh oh. Like those ones, like the the robot dancing. Yeah. yeah, it's gonna be real cool when they're dancing on your grave. <laughs> yeah. I know. It's just like people love to use the word dystopian. And I'm just like, I don't know, man. Like is this robot appropriating a certain culture's dance moves? I'm like, maybe so. It's like this robot it's like is this anim like spider dog thing going to ruin our lives? I'm like, probably not, but a program on a computer might i always thought that was the failure of terminator even though those movies are amazing and the one with christian bale is very underrated directed by mick g very watchable i've seen that thing like seven times but anyway the idea that like a hyper aware robot that exists in the future and could harness time travel would make an arnold schwarzenegger type solution to its benefit is hilarious like you don't need schwarzenegger man we're gonna send back a dude <laughs> a buff dude the same one over and over to kill this one kid who somehow eluded the buff dude it's a great movie franchise i love it could a computer create rx poppy that's indistinguishable from rx poppy hmm do, do the future computer overlord send back an rx poppy to assassinate the rx poppy in our present and which one is the real rx Do you? Man. but yes i guess my problem here with the simulation is that like it just seems all kind of unoriginal i want i want a, I want a new simulation to be to be part of not one that's based on like jules verne novels and shit <laughs> well i love fortune tellers i really do <laughs> You know, like when you're walking you're in Jules Verne day one, <laughs> you know, when you're wa after you're done stuffing yourself with ravioli, stuffed ravioli, and you're walking through the West Village, you're looking for some gelato and you see a fortune teller and you walk a few steps beyond them and they're like, hey, hey, I was just thinking about you. I feel like you're underappreciated within your friend circle and you might feel lonely. Do you want to talk? I'm like, isn't that everybody? It's just like. It's like a big net, right? So like simulation theory, people who are good at predicting things know how to use language better and cast a wide net. And that's why numbers always live because that's a language, you know, it's a way to present an idea. But it's just like, you know what? I think computers are going to be a big deal moving forward. And here they are. It's like, well, yeah. Here they are. You know, um, sooner or later, there was a prediction that I was started to interrupt this, uh, that oh, I always think about it. is like. I want this prediction. I think in the 90s, 60 minutes was like a gallon of water, clean water would be more expensive than a gallon of gasoline. And I was like, what? That makes no sense. You can't drive to Taco Bell with water. But then as soon as you ask somebody before the internet who knew about stuff, it's like, it's already more expensive. I'm like, is it because gas is cheap or water is expensive? And they're like, a little of both. I'm like, oh, so that wasn't a hot take. It was just something that was going to happen. Like, yeah. Anyway, what is a gallon of milk? It has to be like $500, right? <laughs> I mean, the cow has given birth and it is feeding its kid. But instead of feeding its kid, it's feeding your Honey Nut Cheerios. Shout out like, to Carmelo Anthony. Yeah, imagine what a gallon of like human milk would cost. And like oh. cows are super rare. I've done research on this. Oddly, human milk is sold to bodybuilders. Like if you make an excess of breast milk when you have a kid, bodybuilders are waiting to waiting to snatch that stuff up. And what's the price on it? It's not that expensive. Really? I think it's like you can't get rich off of it, but I think you can make a couple thousand bucks if you produce enough. But there's like hardly enough regulation behind it. Like what is how, how are you sure this is first batch of breast milk and not cut with like cow milk oh. almond milk oat milk is this human oat milk 
<laughs> so on a Huffington Post entry that I cannot vouch for, it says a year's supply of robots. human milk. Yeah. A year's supply of human milk could cost you twenty to thirty five thousand yeah, dollars. That sounds about that's, right. Sure. That's not a ton of money, but it's a ton of money, right? Also have no idea how much milk it is. What's a year's worth of milk? What are you making? I know, I know. Um Huffington Post, all aggregated content for a while, right? Are they still doing that? I don't know. Are you making Musatel? <laughs> Musatel? Are you making... Oh, what's the what's the real stringy stuff called? The real stringy cheese. Muzarel? What are you well, talking I mean, about? We got like Muzadel. <laughs> what's the real stringy cheese? Stracciatel. Like uh, you're using human milk on that. Then, oh. then you're, you're just churning through the milk no pun intended Oof. Hmm. no pun intended right um you had mentioned lebron james and outer space mm. earlier and i elbowed that segue out of the way i'm bringing it back <laughs> what did you have in mind when you brought up lebron james in space dude does the toon squad want it enough it's like what this these games shouldn't be this close, man. It should be like Tim Duncan. Whoever wants it should just take care of business in the first half and ceremoniously just like waltz their way to a W. Um, did you watch Space Jam 2? More Space Jams? I have not seen it yet. I've read some of the reviews, and apparently people don't like it very much, but it's also for children. Mm. Um, mm. Are you sure? Is it this, not this for is, children? I, this was the take I heard that the counter to the bad reviews were like, it's for kids. Stop taking this too seriously. I, I want to counter counter that because not oh, only. Oh, yeah. Not only is it for adults, if that's true, which is you know definitely plausible, there's like cartoons and bunnies and wacky special effects and there's no like guns or killing or anything. Sure. It's for kids, but then isn't all sports for kids? So if you're all hot and bothered about Damian Lillard and Ben Simmons and Chris Paul, like this is a, this is for kids, man. Relax, <laughs> right? These guys are wearing bright colors playing a game. But as we all know, like me, a grown adult, yeah. deeply invested in a bouncing basketball. <laughs> I mean, what is for kids? Kids like. We the audience for Space Jam is almost everybody, right? Like sort of like the audience for sneakers, uh, sort of like the audience for collectibles, like action figures. <laughs> aren't aren't Top Shots for kids? Or those? Okay, for okay, adults, okay. We, you know? we get it. We get it. We get it. Slippery slope. How was the movie? Give us give us the quo big board Space Jam review. I got through only two thirds of it. It was not for me at all. It felt like... Oh, I thought it was for everybody. Interesting. <laughs> well, it was supposed to be win over everybody, right? But I think it suffered from a lot of like X-Men failures where it's just like interesting characters. Characters we know about. Interesting actors. And then just a bunch of special effects as they look up at the special effects. It was a lot of that. Um, great great looking stuff awesome looking stuff like ready player one type vibes but like there's only a few good storytellers out there and maybe they didn't get one of them i thought lebron should have been part of the monsters that would have been interesting maybe the monsters aren't the villains i don't know i thought that had potential i have not seen it i'll probably check it out i mean i didn't really even love the first one i wasn't a good movie it was a lower bar then for sure but i liked everything around it i liked the shoes you know i love michael jordan as like a nike guy i thought the gear was amazing even at the time when it wasn't vintage it was like a cool thing right i mean i i it was part of this industry for michael jordan and it was really unique and that it's an animated movie with Michael Jordan and Bugs Bunny. I, it made a lot of sense culturally. Mm -hmm. It just was not a good movie. But I don't know anyone who loved the movie Space Jam. 
Right, right. I just we, felt like it was something you saw when you were little and it had cultural resonance as a result. We all got to come together and rally for Space Jam 2 because Michael Jordan sitting in his spaceship on the planet Mars being like, another W for this guy. Got to got to take it back. The uh the only thing I've seen lately was and, and it, it also has the element of that same nostalgic um for like literally that exact same time of and I would say was the first episode of Fear Street, which is a Netflix kind of also for everyone, but maybe geared towards teens or young adults. I don't know. Um, I, I couldn't. It's kind of a, yeah, kind of a horror like series. Yeah. I mean, there's cursing in it. There's some like really extreme violence. So I don't, yeah. I don't, it's not geared towards like 12 year olds. I don't know who its exact target is. It seems to me as if it's the same kind of core contingency as Stranger Things, which was kind of everyone. Mm -hmm. Like the amount of adults I've seen wearing Stranger Things shirts makes it pretty clear that it was, you know, a, a run it ran the gamut in terms of fandom. But uh, the first episode is set in 1994 and there's subsequent ones which are set in the Yikes. 70s and then one in like the, in like the 1600s or something. Um, but yeah, the 94 thing, I was, it was in a mall, and I'm like, this is all very familiar, kind of Spencer Giftsy types of stuff. Mm -hmm. Hot I was looking for a few more like 94 signifiers, though. Like you wanted Anthony Mason to be dribbling the ball up the court as a hybrid forward? <laughs> yeah, a little more of that, like, I don't know, maybe like a Frankie Cutlass cameo. <laughs> uh, did I tell you I designed a Frankie Cutlass record? Which so, one? I think it was like a, a major label mixtape. It wasn't the famous one. It wasn't Brooke was on the set. No, no, no. I was an intern at a place that did a lunch, bunch of stuff, and they just threw that at me for a summer. I spent a lot of time with Frankie Cutlass. But... See, that's the kind of stuff. <laughs> that you want, that you need from this show on Netflix. That I would have liked. Just like a maybe, I don't know, like a Mad Lion reference. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I, I've... Now you got me stuck on this idea. It's like, I don't believe in adulthood and I don't kind of believe in childhood, right? Because, like, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, like, who is that for? Teenagers, adults, and kids, right? Like, Playboy magazine is for everybody, right? Yeah, it's for anyone who can get their Grumpy sticky kids. little paws on it. Yeah. Uh, but I, yeah, I gave this show a shot, Fear Street. I don't like horror stuff and blood stuff because it scares me. <laughs> Talk about a childish thought. Uh, this stuff gives me nightmares, and I don't like watching people get murdered that much. Just for murder's sake. I love a good Sopranos episode where someone is fishing. Yeah, no, I hear you. I mean, when there was some severe bloodletting, I would kind of turn away until I'd hear the sounds of, like, Shaheem the Rugged Child, and I knew I could turn back. <laughs> right. Like, ooh, is that the Bush Babies? <laughs> is that Diggity Das Effects? Um <laughs> See, I, I really would have enjoyed it if, like, just, like climactic scene. Bum stick. <laughs> bum stick. Bum stick. <laughs> I'm going to miggity murder you. <laughs> They're my <not that. laughs> um, I'm, I'm in a daze of thinking about Daz effects now. But, uh, yeah, I gave that show a shot. I mean, Stranger Things was kind of fun. Uh, the writing was good. I thought the creature stuff was a, was cool. Um, Fear Street, man. I, it's for people who enjoy. I I I said I said this to my wife while we were watching it. I'm like, it feels like this show's for mean people because it just mocks everybody and then murders them. <laughs> it, it was kind of surprisingly cruel in that way. <laughs> yeah, I mean. There were some scenes where it was clear they were trying to generate, you know, some emotion and yeah. even but even by the end, which I'm not going to give any spoilers, yeah. you know, like the characters you're supposed to care about, they don't necessarily have great fates. Right, right. Um, this this is kind of a few weeks late, but, you know, I watched uh, I Think You Should Leave and it kind of gave me the same different but same feeling as Fear Street. It just made me feel bad. <laughs> I was like, I know there's a cringe kind of like, can't look away from it. 
aspect to both these things and they're definitely very different but um i think you should leave just like kind of made me mad i was like this guy sucks <laughs> and i know he's really funny and this is probably hilarious but i'm just getting a vibe that he sucks and i sat through the whole thing and rewatched season one to make sure and i was like yeah this this um what was that comedian's name uh, tom green this tom green stuff isn't quite for me well i don't know if he sucks because mm -hmm. he looked like a pretty good skater and he was all skaters are awesome and he, he was rip. doing some some cool like photos with uh our buddy atiba who is a cookies guest mm -hmm. a couple seasons ago so i'm like i'm giving him the benefit of the doubt oh oh he doesn't suck the kind of comedy and the character is oh okay just okay gotcha worst. gotcha oh no like, he's he, amazing like, this guy seems like he rules Oh, no, no. I think the the characters in the thing. It's like people behaving badly, but not like Seinfeld. It's just people behaving badly and like screaming, <laughs> which was hard because I binged it all in one sitting. And afterwards, I was like, well, I'm definitely in a daze. But no, Tim Robinson seems like a really cool guy with like oh, a gotcha, really distinct gotcha. artistic point of view. Um, I just think I am, again, maybe not his audience. I find his material really hit or miss um i'm not super into a lot of screaming mm -hmm. this character is just being hysterically crazy and screaming yeah. it's sometimes it's funny but overall i'm not a huge fan but when one stuff when stuff hits it's funny yeah for sure for sure like, like the I, pattern trying... on the shirt is like a really great bit like, he's just gotta he, have it. Yes, he has he he has good bits, and I do enjoy sort of the the callbacks on, on different ideas in the same way that like Mister Show used to do that, yeah. or Upright Citizens Brigade, and like sketch comedy, like bouncing yeah. around and then bringing back characters and ideas and jokes, like all that's like part of like that genre. But I I did enjoy some of that. I thought the one where there was a person in the courtroom. And they're reading a transcript about insider trading. Mm -hmm. and yeah. The the transcript of the messaging is just like roasting one of their coworkers who's yeah. also sitting there. I thought yeah. that and they show these events transpiring through the narrator of the person, like the the lawyer reading off yeah. the transcript in the court. That, I thought that was pretty brilliant and, and funny as shit. It's funny because the person giving the testimony was an Asian woman and that was funny. And then the second funniest bit was the Asian guy. The actor who was in oh, *The Walking Dead* with the, like the toilet paper piece that was too small. It's like you had poo on your hands and food being contaminated. It was like a really funny bit, but like it just kind of made me feel. And I don't want shows to always have like a nice tidy ending where like Chris Farley was amazing because he scored a bunch of points in the playoffs. And, like he needs more help than Kristaps Porzingis, I think. Chris Ops is not the problem for Chris Farley. It's them adding another player to the, to the two of them. But Chris Farley was the best because, like, he was kind of sympathetic, right? Like, he would do all this outrageous stuff, ruin everything, be the worst. And you're like, someone save him. Well, I think part of the Chris Farley appeal was that those characters always seem to have good intentions. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Um and he kind of his comedy worked because you definitely it was so dark right because you were laughing at him with tim robinson you were laughing with him at someone else which is like kind of a cool idea too but in the end chris farley was like kind of tragic and tim robinson's kind of like an aggressor right to i think me. that's true yeah. i think that's true um yeah tim robbins is like robinson Robinson, excuse me. He's I kind of like the ones where he's not the main character. Mm -hmm. I like when he I like when he's the normie and the, or the straight guy. It's kind of fun. Mm -hmm. Because he's so this he's got that elasticized face and he reminds me a little bit of Jim Carrey, you know, from Living Color in that way. Like mm -hmm. this just like so over the top goofy character that is also kind of opaque. Yeah, like Fire, Mar Fire Marshal Bill, right? Like kind of the same cringe humor. Yeah, just like mugging for the camera. And yeah. It, I don't know. I, I liked seeing when uh, Tim Robinson is acting like a normal person. Like, oh, yeah, right, he can actually be an actor too. That's cool. I like well, that. Watching him sit down, 
after doing a bunch of skating and like being out of breath and sweaty and talking about skating i'm just like oh god man this is kind of amazing what he did with the show because you believe he is that person right uh amazing i it's a it's a great great show but we're just like i was just thinking about things that aren't for me like i love das effects and maybe i think you should leave maybe not so much diggity das effects <laughs> I'm just thinking about a a guy about to get like stabbed in a horror movie. <laughs> bum stickity bum stickity bum. Man. Yeah, yeah. There was um, a while Das Effects was like hot. Like we were just like, damn, those are some verses. Well, there was a couple songs where they got away from the bum stickity bum stickity bum. Yeah, and were kind of trying to tell stories. Mm-hmm. And be like normal rappers. Not as fun, right? Come on. Well, the only one I remember was a song called Hard Like a Criminal. That I don't believe is on any album. It may have come out later on some like... Soundtrack? You know, remixes. or It could have been on a soundtrack. I don't, I, I don't recall. Yeah. But I remember it being kind of a cool song because it was Dots Effects not doing their shtick. Mm. But I might go back and listen to it now and it might suck. I just only remember that they got away from doing their bum stickity bum stickity bum stuff like once in a blue moon um people were clowning the space jam 2 soundtrack is there any way to make that cool in 2021 was there i can i i can i believe i can fly yeah i I mean they tried it's kind of uplifting there's moments i think chance of rappers on it it's it's very aggregated i think the controversy was the jonas brothers had a track on it um but, you know, the first question is, is it a great song? It turns out it's not a great song. Uh, it would be amazing if the Jonas Brothers had the anthem for Space Jam 2. Um, but, like, is there any way to make that cool? Are you putting all the RX rappers on there? <laughs> yes. I also am <laughs> laughing because I thought Hard Like a Criminal, which was, like, them kind of making, like, a tough street record. Uh-huh. And the first line is, well, biggity bust a move. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, I guess they were still doing it on that one. <laughs> Can Mike Green Green step up his game a little bit when well, he calls Well, biggity bust a move. I biggity be the trooper because I'm slamming. <laughs> like, okay, all right, all right. <laughs> Yo, after Good record, though, good record. <laughs> when Bone Thugs was trying to do this thing successfully, Das Effects had a lot of success. And uh, I thought it was like a good leap to take. Like, is this working, guys? And we're like, yep, yep, definitely not. Um, I don't know. If they came out first, though, right? Das Effects came out in, like, 91. Were they before Bone Thugs? I don't know. I always thought Bone I, Thugs was first. I think so, but I don't know. I don't know. Whatever. Whatever. Who knows? It's all, it's all irrelevant. Um, so, basketball. <laughs> Apparently, the, uh, <laughs> the finals, the finals happened. ended yesterday. And if yeah. we have nothing else to say about Mad Lion... <laughs> No other Mad Lion content at all. We can (laughs) talk about hoops. Our new champs, the Milwaukee Bucks. This is, I mean, as for all the the Patreon subscribers that we are so grateful Mm. for, everyone who's been following Cookie, the day ones, man. The real day ones. Are you mad that your least favorite team won the championship? This title is for you, from us, Bucks Day Ones. <laughs> Are you mad your favorite fraudulent player, Giannis Antetokounmpo, is the biggest superstar on the planet today? Before we talk about those <laughs> specifics, I want to know what your rooting interests were. Did you have any over the course of this series? It was based off of the shallowest, dumbest stuff but I was a Bucks day one because I did not like the Suns in four guy. I think violence is bullshit, and he beat up that guy, even though he was punched at. So I was not into him. And then counting money guy. It just, like, worked out for me. The, the, Bucks, the Bucks were my team this, this week. I started out as a Suns day one. It was mostly because Chris Paul oh, is yeah. a great player. And I wanted him to win a chip in, in a in an amorphous way. Yeah. It wasn't like, man, I want to see Chris Paul win a chip. It was like, that would be cool. But I got to say, with everyone echoing that same milk toast sediment, mm-hmm. oh, 
I want to see Chris Paul get a chip. That would be nice for Chris Paul to get a chip. Wow. Kind of took the kind of took the luster mm. out for of sure. rooting for a Chris Paul victory because there were no haters. And as French Montana said, you got to have haters. <laughs> there, were, there weren't enough haters. You know, I'm thinking back to the the skirmishes of, of the early 2000s between Chris Paul admirers and like the Darren Williams stands. Same draft. That was right. I mean, that was a heated debate. Oh, not the who same was draft. better? My, my because best, yeah. they were. I don't know if they're the same draft or they were close. I forget exactly. Yeah, I think, but yeah, uh, they were. They were. They were rivals. They were in the West Coast, yeah. and although Chris Paul was the better player, Darren Williams fans had this argument because he gave Chris Paul the business when they played head to head and, and Yo, got Darren some Williams was good, play. man. He was Very good, good for a few years. Yeah, a, a, a forgotten hooper. If you will. People not hate him player, because of his haircut. Not a player, a hooper. Yeah. yeah. People just didn't like the way he looked. He was good. He burnt out. But shout out to Darren Williams. He was a good player. Very good. Very good. I, I'm not going to look it up. But he might have been a seven-time All Star. I mean, he was Jesus. very, very good. I'm looking it up. But I'm saying off. seven. I'm saying seven. Um, but with everyone just being casually accepting of a Chris Paul title, it didn't feel like it would three prove much. Yeah, three-time All Star. That's, this is very good. That's as many as Ben Simmons, who's done wow. it in four years. Wow. Darren Williams was on pace to be a Hall of Famer. Oh, he was. Absolutely. Darren Williams was good. Got into a fight with the Utah fans. I don't know. He had a I thought, I thought he went more, but I guess, to the All-Star game more, but I guess he didn't really do that when he was in Jersey and stuff like that. I mean, he made the All-NBA team twice. That's really difficult to do. Oh, he, he was great. For some yeah. reason, I just thought his duration of excellence was longer than it was. Yeah, I mean, he really faded. He got kind of he enjoyed the Bucatine. Uh, I think there's there's Bucatine kings out there can, that can still get into the Hall of Fame, but he might not be one of them. Played in Brooklyn, small market team. <laughs> um, but anyway, so I liked Chris Paul. I was I was hoping he would win, but I just felt bland and then watching the series the Phoenix fans were not my favorite but that wasn't really the inspiration it was more that I started kind of looking at these two organizations and although I do find it subversive for a team to come out of nowhere have no identity add Chris Paul and just win a chip like that's kind of that's what happened no but I'm saying that's so weird and that hasn't yeah. really occurred. Mm. I'm like, I like that. That just cheapens winning a title to an extent that's quite funny. Oh, the champs are the Suns. All right. How did they get here? I don't know. They didn't make the playoffs last year. Their younger guys developed a bit, and they got Chris Paul and Jake Crowder, and they just won a title. Yeah. I kind of liked that. Yeah. But I started really feeling more connection to the Bucks as an organization as boomery as it is when I was like you know what these guys went all in they had their guy they built around him they sort of they figured it out they've been very very good for three years in a row you know they flamed out in the playoffs a couple times they kept coach bud they kept you know their main two stars together they didn't panic they spent so much to get Drew Holiday. Yeah, and, and that's what I mean. They went all in, and, like, you know what? They waited for their opportunity, and they were not the best team in the league this nope. year. They should have lost to Brooklyn. They were not as good as Brooklyn. They, you know, they no almost, one's as good as Brooklyn. No, no, they should have yeah. lost to Brooklyn. Like, let's, yeah. just, let's just be straight with that. Yeah. And Giannis would have gone down as a goat, even though not he played great goat. in that series. Not a good goat. No, no, as a bad kind of goat as opposed yeah. to the best kind of goat. People yeah. would have said... Oh, Giannis couldn't get them by a team that only had KD. Yeah, it was it was it was a toenail, man. It was a toenail. That was the difference between the Bucks being out and Giannis being a laughing stock. Even though he didn't deserve to be, he's the same player, same exact dude. Yeah. He balled out that series. He averaged thirty. Yeah, but he would have gone down as a goat. Yeah, I, I have take exhaustion. You're right. Like Kyrie Irving doesn't land funny, and the Nets probably waltz their way to a Nets when you're in five, six, right? Yeah. And we don't even yeah. care about Giannis. This whole coronation yeah. thing never happens. But this is the fragility of, of, of takes, mm -hmm. the take economy. Is that yeah. these things happen and then you have to come up with reasons for it. Yeah. 
Well, KD got his big toe on that line because he's a loser. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't have court awareness. That's his problem. He's too dumb yeah. to get his foot behind that line. No, but you, and then you have to come up with something. Yeah. So I, I did start having a lot of sympathy for the Bucks for that reason. They just kept being good. They weren't the best team. They got kind of lucky against the Bucks. They didn't have to go through many teams that had a great uh, solution yeah, yeah. Yeah. For, for Giannis. But that's what you do. You stay good and, and you yep. keep the ability to win a title for as long as possible and then go out and fucking get it. Because you can't always be the Hamptons Five. You can't always be the Brooklyn Nets. You can't yeah. have nine all-stars together or whatever. Like yeah. Sometimes you just have to do what the Bucks did and just hope for your shot. And... You know, the Red Sea parted and like, boom, yep. we yep. get a chip. That's what we did this for. We disappointed you last year. We disappointed the year before that. We could have easily disappointed you this year, but we didn't. We won a goddamn title. Yeah. I mean, it reminds me of what Masai here did in Toronto. It's like, why are you getting Kawhi as a rental? He's like, ah, good point, but I just want to be there when it counts. And the Red Sea parted for them as well. Um, in almost a flash of an eye which was crazy twice and um i agree i really also it was easy to root for the bucks because when the suns went up 2-0 a lot of people were saying that this is going to be a sweep and the suns and four guy was right and he's going to be a star because he was gastrodamus and the bucks don't make adjustments and coach bud is an old school coach who cannot who cannot move from his foundational premise of what a basketball team game is. And then I was like, all right, I disagree with all of that, but that was a valid take. So no gotcha stuff, no digging up old takes, like no, stuff we're not, changes. We're, we're, we're not going to cop it up here. No. On, on, no. on, on, on the, not the take police. We love when people give takes out because like we need, <laughs> we need ideas in the world. So when my favorite analysts are like sons and four, I'm like, that's awesome. Thank you for doing that. I disagree. And I was shocked that the Bucks won four in a row. But I, I like him as well, to your point, because, you know, we were talking about the Sixers so much being in the East, the coastal elite media circle. And like all this talk about trading a star, be careful because you want to add stars to stars, as we've been saying forever. And that's kind of what the Bucks did. Um, and Giannis was a repeat MVP. You don't give up on him if you're Milwaukee. But he he's not perfect. To your point on, there was a blog post that just dropped today about... New blog alert. Blog on cookieshoops.com. And um, yeah, you, you make a good point. It's like he's an imperfect superstar. He can't dribble. He can't do some of the skill things we expect. That's why we have like these bullshit debates about who's a baller and who's a basketball player because Giannis kind of frays our understanding of what we're looking at because he doesn't play like this is my whole like dribble bias thing. Giannis doesn't look like someone who should be this dominant and you're like, well, he's just doing it because he's big. James Harden said that last year, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, he's just big. He's just doing what big people do. I'm like, well, first, being big is a skill. And then second, like, he doesn't have to worry about dribbling to be a great, the best player on the court. But Chris Ball might have to. And Chris Ball is, could also be the best player on this court, you know? You know, when, when I've been critical of Giannis, it's also a, about his aesthetics. Sometimes I don't enjoy watching him play. Yeah, he's a bumbling, fumbling kind of big. But I have never, ever been someone who says he's not good at what he does. There are people who are like, he's not good because he can't shoot a, a step back. I'm like, he shouldn't take step backs. Oh, We've yeah, been saying for done. years that he shouldn't yeah. take threes, and everyone explained to us how he you know, keeps the defense honest. You know, no. he shot 18% from three in the playoffs. They were useless shots. They were bad possessions. And you know what? Everybody wins. He, he, he threw away possessions. They still want to chip. Yeah. He took slightly less, yeah. and that helped the team. I, yeah. I don't know. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. I was laughing, though, because last game, I forget who was, I think it was Aiton, was guarding him and actually went for an up fake <laughs> on a three ball. And I was like, it happened. It's happened yeah. twice in his career. 
And the only other one I can remember was Al Horford went for it one time. And I was like, who goes for a Giannis three-point up fake? It never happens. And I was like, that one person who's like, keeps the defense honest. Like, there's your moment to shine, man. (laughs) You've been claiming this forever. It's completely untrue. But you got it. You got it. In the finals, Aiton went for a pump fake. Like, keeps defense honest. Let's go. Aiton is... I love watching team's game plan Aiden because with Chris Paul sometimes he looks like he's unlocked and Tyson Chandler too on offense right like just alley-oop like lobs efficiency he can shoot free throws okay like this guy is he like an unlocked offensive weapon and coach Bud was just like no Giannis is just going to attack him and confuse him and he turned into like Nazir Muhammad Nick's legend Nazir Muhammad had potential I'm a fan there's no slight on Nazir Sixers legend as well yeah and Hawks legend too um but like he kind of started fading away and shooting these little baby jumpers and I'm like coach Bud well done man you know coach Bud got so much heat and it, it was reminiscent of the stuff I heard from Brett Brown I'm like what exactly are you mad about was it they didn't play Giannis enough minutes? Like, okay, okay. I feel like that's a that's a reasonable critique, but that's it? Yeah. That's the whole critique that you think the guy who devised this game plan, the guy who turned Giannis from you know a good player into a multiple time MVP, the one who was there and and I would believe his strategy played a role in them bringing in guys like um, like Brooke Lopez and, and Holiday and Portis and, and, and built this team. You wanted him fired because you thought Giannis should play five more minutes a game? Like, I'm not saying he's perfect. No. But we're just going to say this guy is like a trash can? I, I don't know. I, I, coaches are meat shields, man. They are. I'm, I, I'm, I'm not saying Coach Bud is perfect. I'm saying based on his success in Atlanta and Milwaukee, he's probably pretty good at his job. He's a guy who came out from under Popovich Again, he doesn't have to be perfect, but he's probably good at what he does. Yeah. Who is, I know it's not Phil Jackson, who is the Bucks Zen coach? Because Coach Bud had, a, in my opinion, a wonderful quote in the beginning of the series, I believe, where he was like, listen, it's so frustrating being a coach, but this is the fun of the game. It's all probability. You do your best, and then in the end, the ball goes in or it doesn't. And you have to live with it, and this is why it's amazing. And people got really mad at him being like, or you can coach your players correctly and they could succeed. You put them in a position to succeed. And He's already farther along in that idea than the criticism of it. And I really loved him saying that. That coupled with Giannis saying, like, Middleton should take the last shot because he's a better shooter, guys. Or getting beat by Kevin Durant in a game and be like, Kevin Durant's the best player on the planet. Like, bow down to this guy. Like, I love all that stuff. So it was really easy to root for Giannis, and he didn't have any of the the Jordan originalism. Who is their life coach? Because he sounds awesome. Do you think there is a life coach? Is it just Coach Bud? It could be, man. Like, this These Bud's all sound like things that Popovich would have muttered at some point over a glass Ab- of absolutely. Pinot Noir. Absolutely. Popovich is a king. Coach Bud is king, too. More kings. Um, but I just love the point of view. I was tweeting about this last night. Like the Suns, I love the Suns too. I like Booker. I love Monte Ellis. I love volume scores. They're fun to watch. Chris Paul is a top, top NBA player of all time. And who's a step slow, which is sad to finally see him run out of talent because he's a full step slower than he used to be. And um, they, but they had like this Jordan originalism to them, right? Like, They had this fierceness about them being like, we're not joking around, man. This is the finals, and we're here to deliver on our promise. And the books had some of that too, but Giannis was like doing a lot of social media stuff, and like they definitely scowl and flex and stuff, but the identity of their team is Giannis, and Giannis is always joking with his wife on IG and ordering chicken nuggets, and I really appreciate like this kind of new kind of superstar. Yeah, I think Giannis has always been a, a, a charming guy. He was just on a platform when people were hearing from him a lot. Mm. And he has such an interesting voice. <laughs> yeah, it's very high-pitched. And also has a Greek accent. Yeah, it's bizarre. <laughs> it's, right? it's, it's a funny-ass voice. Yeah. 
and, and the whole thing when he was like, what American food should I try, guys? <laughs> it's like, where's Milwaukee? And like, I don't know. Him and his wife are a great, like, good cop, bad cop thing. She's like, show, what are you doing? Kids are watching. And he's doing his whole freak thing. I think he's great. And I, I'm i pleased that that team won. But I was scared of the the toxicity that Chris Paul was about to have come his way. But he scored a bunch of points. So <laughs> that's all people care about. Yeah, he scored a I lot mean, of points. I, I thought the, the main takeaway for the finals for me was that, you know, I think for the second year in a row in the playoffs, like we've noticed, you know, the, what's the word I'm looking for? The, uh, the, the, the plentitude oh, okay. of, of like bucket men. And then they okay. run into someone who can defend. Yeah. And I thought that was really a cool twist on the Booker saga that, Booker played really well and had big scoring nights, but he couldn't involve mm-hmm. his team. Mm-hmm. And they tried to flip it up a little bit and move the ball around more. And then Booker kind of got clamped by Holiday. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought that was really interesting. And we're in an era that really values perimeter scores, combo guards. They can all shoot. They can all dribble. They can all pass a bit. They can all get to the rack. There are so many good ones in the league. They're everywhere. You know, the amount of dudes who can score 20 points per 36 minutes on, like, league average efficiency or upwards is probably, like, 60. It feels like they're like, all on the teams. Shake Kings. Milton can do it. Yeah. You know, Tyrese Maxey might be able to do it. Like, IQ. They're just, they're just IQ. They're just everywhere. Alec Burks. They're everywhere. Mm-hmm. So to see Holiday as an outlier good on-ball defender give Booker fits because Booker's kind of the god of those dudes. Yeah, you know, he's, he, he's, he's a good one. Yeah, He's like the apex prom king from the modern era. Yeah, And, and he, to yeah. see him just like get shelved by Drew Holiday was pretty cool. And as he was scoring in volume until the last game, like he was... He was doing his job, and mm-hmm. I agree. He's he's the most fascinating, one of the most fascinating things about this series because if he does his job and scores in volumes, it it kind of stagnated, and the Bucks were like, we'll, "We'll let you do this if you take Chris Paul and these ball movers out of the the equation." And then if he's not shooting well, then you have the best of both worlds, right? And when Booker decides he's hot he takes himself as a playmaker out of the game because he's their second best playmaker. And that's what was going to make him different than all these other players that you just mentioned. He was kind of developing kind of a, a, a different wrinkle to his game, which is shot creation for his teammates who are ready and willing, right? Like Jay Crowder, uh, Bridges, and Aiton are, are valve guys that you can absolutely incorporate into a lethal offense. And I mean, this, this, yes, yes. I was just going to agree. The Suns are one of the most kind of traditional teams we've seen in quite some time. Mm-hmm. You know, you have like the point god, yeah. you know, the guy yeah. who controls, you know, every facet of the game. You've David got the prom Robinson. king. Yeah. And then your other guys are like two, three and D wings, mm-hmm. kind of undersized, yeah. but space the floor. And then a big man who catches lobs. Yeah. I'm like, this is a. This is a prototype team. Mm-hmm. They don't have one weird player on this entire team. Yeah, you know yeah. what? I mean, maybe like Dario Saric or something. But they could have used them. Yeah. They could have used them. But out of that starting group, it is such a normal team. Yeah, I know. The only Cam, real Cam anomaly Johnson is was a welcome change. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just mean they were a very, they were a really good team. Yeah. They, they deserve to be there. They beat the teams who were in front of them. It was a coin flip. They could have won, man. They could have won. They could have yeah. won. All this talk about. Oh my God, Giannis establishing himself as like oh. the greatest talent in the NBA. Like, he was the best player in the series by a mile. I agree. Yeah. Still, almost lost. Dude, the, the the memorable moments we got were incredible. Me and you were talking about this when Drew Holiday stole the ball from Booker. He should have gathered and gotten fouled, but I'm so glad he went for that alley oop for Giannis. And Giannis, it was a bad pass, and Giannis converted. It was just incredible that we got that. I was screaming at my my phone. I was watching on my phone, and I was like, 
bring the ball in. Like, do not go for the home run pass. And when it connected, I was just like, I was wrong about everything. It was such I mean, a cool even, moment. Yeah. Even that play, yeah. that play specifically, yeah. you know, when they don't call a timeout, which I think is the right move. They have the ball in Booker's hands. That's who you want to get it anyway. Yeah. And you have the personnel that you're going to leave on the floor out there. Great. Yeah. Cool. Don't let the defense get a chance to talk. Don't let the defense change up its personnel. Yeah. Do your thing. No issues at all with that. Mm-hmm. But, like, this is what we're talking about with this, the fragility of everything. <laughs> yeah. You know, so Booker starts driving, and he's kind of, he's coming from the right. He gets into the lane. And Tucker comes over Tucker. And, kind of, and kind of, like, shunts him towards the left. He's got a, if, he's got a step on him. If, if Booker goes up right into Tucker, mm-hmm. makes sure to hit him with his elbow, mm-hmm. maybe he gets... Two shots. Maybe they win that game. If he stays right and Tucker is able to like stick with him, he still would have an angle to drop the ball off to Aiton. But Booker takes one step to the left, which then creates a situation where Aiton is trying to scramble to get to the other side of the lane now so he can stay on weak side as a pass, or as a, um, an option for a pass, and they're doomed. That was yeah. it. The game was over. That one extra freaking dribble. It it created an opportunity for Booker to be double teamed with nowhere to go. And then for Drew Holiday to come in at the last second because his back was to Drew as Drew was charging him. Like that was the game. One extra dribble to the left basically ended their season. One extra dribble to the left created an artificial triple team because you had Booker, uh, Tucker on ball, Giannis lurking behind Tucker and Drew on the weak side. And in that situation, then you say, well, wait a minute. What if we put in Kaminsky? What if we call a timeout and put in Kaminsky? I like Kaminsky. And we had him just yeah. stretching the floor instead Doofus. of having Aiton waiting around the basket. Yeah. And then we go four out, and we have Booker just go ISO at the top of the key. I, yeah. I'm not yeah. saying that would have created a better result, but yeah. just all these like moving tumblers that fall into place is, is what makes this whole shit fun. Dude, Booker, if you're the – coach if you're coach bud and you're like yo booker is going to take the last shot and we'll live with that like if he wants to be the hero ball guy in the suns let's roll and you know it you know confirmation bias it worked out for the bucks but like booker also had that amazing lob to Aiton, which i thought was beautiful but Giannis is just an incredible athlete and blocked the shot and that could have gone either way too um I mean, even even if Chris Paul is able to foul Giannis and kind of undercut him right. before he gets that lob down, yeah. then Giannis, who previously to game six was bricking everything from the line, yeah. all of a sudden, instead of it being a three-point game with him going to the line to get one more yeah. and then getting the tip out after his miss, now he's going to the line with a one-point lead. We, he misses the first foul shot which was the one that got tipped out and then they got anyway. And now he's looking at a second shot with a one point lead and like what, 10, 11 seconds left. Yeah. Like, yeah, totally different results. If Chris Paul is just able to get there a fraction of a second earlier and like take out Giannis's yeah. legs. It's, it's kind of interesting. Like gone is the Monty Williams narrative that he's like in an emotional, he went through so much and there was that footage of him talking eight and up. You know, gone is the idea that the big man is back with Aiton, the traditional big man. The CP3 thing, the Booker being a top 10 player, that's probably gone. It's so interesting because it was a game of inches. Not only if we talk about how the Bucks got there, but in the finals itself. And uh, to your point a long time ago, it, these were not the two best teams in the league. I thought the Clippers and the Nets should have been there. Even the Utah Jazz, eh, no, I, I don't think they were actually better than the Clippers. But um, it worked out to its peak entertainment value, these finals, but not its peak narrative ways. You know, because- you know and that, that was kind of what we were talking about in the blog post yeah. is about not having the kind of stakes that we were accustomed to because of LeBron James and, and his presence was so overwhelming for the league Mm -hmm. and all of those 
Jordan versus LeBron, Kobe versus LeBron, Durant versus LeBron, just the LeBron wars. And having those settled in 2016 when he brought a title to Cleveland upon his return, it's really taken the steam out of the last few finals, which isn't a bad thing. Yeah, it's yeah, just no. it's just it's just different. So ratings. Yeah, it, it's funny to watch the series and say, "Awesome, Giannis got a chip." Yeah, what does it mean? It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> yeah, it means very little. I mean, he's a great player. We can we can manufacture these discussions. Oh, it means that he's now above Anthony Davis. I okay, man. He was okay. already a Hall of Famer. Of, like. But I mean, you you can have these discussions. Is he better than KG? Okay, if we want to do arguments, okay. Yeah. Is he as good as Tim Duncan and KG? I, I don't know, man. He, yeah. he, he's, he's only like 27 years old or some shit. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I don't know. It, I don't want to take anything away from Giannis either, right? Because like what, what we create is the thing. Or I don't know. Who's in the prison then? Uh, I, I I'm more saying we don't need to generate more. He's a back-to-back MVP. Right. He stole a Defensive Player of the Year award. Yeah, he, I mean, players always steal that award. No, he, Go he, 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 no I'm saying he, he's, got, he, he's got an MVP, an MVP, a Defensive Player of the Year award, and then he's got an NBA title. Like, yeah. we don't need to put him into imaginary rankings necessarily. If you want to, you can. That's fun. I just mean we're still building how good he is. There's no reason to jump this forward. Yeah. And, and I think the main takeaway for me is this is a new beginning, right? Because Giannis was Some able to Wars, smash through basically zero competition. Yeah. Guys who were on his level on the way to winning this title. There was no big man. He didn't have to beat anyone. He didn't have a physical war other than going against Bam in the first round. He didn't but have good. to play Julius Randle. Man. He didn't have to. But those things are going to happen, though. Yeah. And like, that's why I kind of like this. Like, okay, Giannis, you're the king now. Can LeBron get that get that crown back? Maybe because I mean, next year LeBron versus Giannis. Now we're starting to talk about like some like passing of the torch shit for real. So yeah. I'm 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 hopeful that this will lead to some really cool stuff in a way that this is just good vibes. Yeah, and that's I mean, kind of where it ends. Yeah, in order to have a post go viral, someone has to post the post with zero likes and zero retweets, and in order to create a new vibe with these young stars someone has to go first so Giannis to your point next year if Giannis gets back to the finals we have so much more to talk about and so much more context on one hand I miss LeBron James so much this month because he does so much heavy lifting with cool ideas and cool arguments and uh, familiarity and awesome basketball play on the other hand we cannot manufacture another LeBron in terms of our storytelling if someone doesn't go first and Giannis did so this one it was like there was a victimless crime come almost like both these teams I think were wonderful champions this year but next year now you have more going into it like oh Giannis thinks he's this good Mm, he's not as good as so and so and so and so like Tim Duncan or whatever Uh, so we just have to build on that and it goes by so fast because these these seasons there's not enough of them right like i just feel like we just don't know have have enough data for these arguments to actually be uh truthful because we don't have enough champions well i also think about the kind of pressure that was released when lebron won that title against golden state and that cleveland this is for you it's going to take some time for that pressure to build up. Things have to happen. Stuff has to move around. Like the soda can has to be shaken. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't open it up and then it goes, and then you just put the thing back on. You got to shake it. So like, this is hopefully where we're headed. So Giannis winning this, that's shaking things up. Mm -hmm. We have a new guy who's won multiple MVPs. He's a finals MVP. Everyone's like, this is the best player on the planet right now. Okay, cool. We got ourselves ourselves a new king. Can you beat Mitchell Robinson? Prove it. Can he beat? KD next season with yeah. Harden and Kyrie. That's interesting. Beat him this year, then won a title. Can he take a game off Emmanuel quickly? Prove it. <laughs> Can you do this to Mitch Robinson? Yeah. Do you have bars like Damian Lillard? 
Can Giannis okay. rap? <laughs> I would say no. <laughs> but um, maybe Greek words end a lot of vowels, so he can just kind of cheat. And I love those high-pitched rappers, right? Like, I love Q-Tip's voice, so maybe Giannis has a future there for me. <laughs> uh, Mad Skills had a, also nasally delivery. Um, Big L, another <sighs> nasally delivery rapper. Bush Babies, naturally. Yeah. Oh, previously aforementioned Bush Babies. <laughs> but, yeah, no, I, I, think, I think this is a cool starting point. We have a new king, and it's like, all right. You're going to have to get through the Nets next year. Mm. You might have to beat LeBron in, in the finals. That's a fun, that's a fun next season. Dude, Daryl Morey, who has said this about LeBron, is probably looking at Giannis now being like, okay, game on. I want to I wanna dispatch of you in the second round. Like, this is going to be great, right? That's what I mean. This is cool. Yeah. And, and when I look at even I look at Philly, I'm like, there's probably five guys in the league who can kind of credibly guard Giannis and, and at the, Joel for, the, and for the time being. They have, they have two of them. Yeah. Can I have a quick Simmons aside, which I, I know I'm going to get roasted for. <laughs> but I want to say it anyway because it's been stop. on my mind. You won't I, stop. After watching Space Jam 2. He's a young man. Leave him alone. He's a, like a young man. <laughs> like he's been getting shit since the age of 22. Let's stop it a little bit. He just turned 25. Yeah, like dudes, let him grow up. <laughs> like he's a child still like these kids man just like uh, that's that's my thought can we just like give these kids some space to like grow into adults <laughs> i don't know that's all i got i hear you <laughs> kids are all right let them live I don't, the the toxicity from i said that word twice today the birth happy birthday post was so mean i thought that was such a layup for this guy just on his birthday to get dunked on randomly when there's a finals game that he's not even in <laughs> like what are we doing man Giannis is playing tonight for for all the marbles all the marbles not, not some of the marbles all the marbles we did it a perfect pod mm. end of the season all the marbles cookies cookies I love cookies I love cookies Thank you.